As we prepare to worship God together this morning, we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah when he said, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. Our reading from God's word this morning is taken from the gospel according to John. John chapter 6 reading verses 25 to 40. John 6 beginning to read at verse 25. The setting is Jesus having just performed the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. He is withdrawn from the crowd and has spent a brief time on his own. Disciples have tried to cross the lake uh, and have found themselves in the midst of a storm. And Jesus comes to them and brings them safely to the other side. And uh, the crowds go in search of Jesus to Capernaum. And it says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe on the one he has sent. So they asked him, what, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me Will never I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Day. So reads the word of God. Please turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them there before you, to John chapter 6. Uh, we'll um, be looking in particular at verse 35, uh, where Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But in looking at this one verse, I hope to uh, delve into other parts of this great sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, and to do so especially as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's table and to receive the bread and the wine that the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded us to receive in order that we might enjoy that particular fellowship with him, communion with him, uh, in order that he might minister to us through this special sacrament that he has gifted to the church through the ages. John chapter 6 is a fascinating chapter in John's gospel. Uh, it's one of the longest, if not the longest chapter, um, but it's also one of the most surprising uh, 
in terms of where the Lord Jesus takes us in the chapter. It begins with the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. All the Gospels record the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. But John alone uh, takes us into a deeper insight and understanding of what Jesus was doing through this miracle. He wasn't simply providing food for those who were hungry, uh, but rather he was opening people's eyes to understand more fully who he was and why he came into this world. And in that sense, and as John does in other instances when it comes to the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ, John not only provides a record of the miracle that Jesus performed, but he adds in a sermon that Jesus preached. And, and here in John's Gospel, we have what is often described as the bread of life discourse, uh, where Jesus goes on to explain, to open up uh, what really was taking place in terms of this extraordinary miracle where with one small boy's five loaves and two uh, fishes, um, he uh, fed 5,000 plus people. And he was saying it was really a way of showing who he is, that he is the bread of life. He is the one who alone is able to meet the needs and satisfy the deepest longings of the souls of all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds. Later on in this discourse, Jesus goes on to, to say in very stark words, uh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, unless you drink the blood of the Son of Man, then you have no part in him. And, and those words obviously troubled those who heard them at the very first time because it was the means of triggering a major dispute amongst the crowds. Indeed, it did so in such a way as it turned the vast majority of the crowds that day against him. So much so that say, there were so many turned away and left him. Uh, those who had been following him in some shape or form up to that point. That by the end of the chapter, we are left with just 12 men still standing. His own disciples. And Jesus says to them, will you leave me also? And Peter responds with the well-known words acting as the spokesman of the disciples yet again, Lord, to whom can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. But the language that's used in that passage uh, that is echoed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 when he gives clear instruction to the Corinthian church about the Lord's Supper and what it entails, what it means, how it is to be received, how it is an instrument of blessing upon us, uh, makes it clear that, that what Jesus was saying here in John chapter 6, even though these words were spoken before he had instituted the Lord's Supper formally, nevertheless he was preparing the way for the Lord's Supper and how the disciples were to understand it and how the church was to enjoy it as time went by in the course of the unfolding history of the church thereafter. And, and it's in that sense as we come to understand what God is saying, what Jesus Christ is saying to us in this passage about him being the bread of life, it surely helps us to, to get our minds around what it is to sit at his table, to receive the bread and wine uh, that not only speak to us in an emblematic form about the Lord Jesus and all that he is as our saviour, but the way in which we, through the supper, and by the workings of God's Holy Spirit, Christ communes with us, and we commune with him. To use the language of one of the old liturgies of the Anglican Church, that we feed upon him by, with, with thanksgiving by faith in our hearts. That the Lord Jesus ministers to us, comes to us, engages with us in a very special way as we gather around this table. And that explains why when Paul gives the instructions about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, he includes warnings in those instructions that we should not come thoughtlessly or carelessly to this table because we should be reminding ourselves constantly whose table it is. It is the Lord's table and whom it is 
with whom we have communion, namely the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And with all that in mind, uh, I want to reflect then upon this statement that we have in verse 35 in John's Gospel. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Uh, To help us understand what Jesus uh, is teaching us in order that we might better appreciate what Jesus Christ is giving us as we come around this table. In the first place, Jesus is reminding us that he, in a very unique sense, touches the deepest need of any and every human being. He, in a unique sense, touches the deepest need of any human being. Jesus is using the language of hunger and thirst here in this verse. He uses the language of longing. Whenever you speak about being hungry, whenever you speak about being thirsty, when you speak about being parched or starving, you're speaking about deep physical longings, deep needs that need to be satisfied, that unless you get food, unless you get something to drink, um, you're going to struggle, uh, and you need those longings to be met. And it ties in with the fact that as human beings, we are creatures with deep cravings and longings of one sort or another. It's not just that we have a daily longing for food and drink, but we have other deep longings that that are part of our makeup as human beings. We have longings for, for intimacy, for close companionship. We have longings for entertainment and Uh, for pleasure. We have longings for achievement with what we do with our lives. All those things and many more speak to us about about, about the fact that even from our earliest years, there are deep longings within us that drive us in terms of how we shape the course of our life. But there's one particular longing that Jesus has in mind in this statement, and that is the deep longing of the soul a deep-seated desire in all of us as human beings for spiritual fulfillment. You know, it's curious, isn't it, that you can tick almost all the boxes of the achievements that we long for in life. Academic success, sporting success, uh, all our social needs and longings being met, uh, all the different dreams that we have being fulfilled, and yet still somehow feel hopelessly empty, that something vital is missing. And it was St. Augustine who put his finger on it all those years ago when he said, Lord, you have made us for yourself, and we have no peace until we find our peace in you. There's something about our makeup as human beings that sets us apart from every other living species on this planet that in a unique sense we have been made by God and we've been made for God and we can only find our true meaning, significance, fulfillment and satisfaction when we are restored to God and are in fellowship with him. And, And Jesus has that very much in mind when he speaks of the deepest desire of the human heart. It's one that can only be satisfied by God himself. You see, there was no need for Jesus to identify the many different cravings and longings which, even though they may be met in our experience, will never ever adequately satisfy us in terms of reaching to the depths of our need. We can identify those things ourselves because we we can easily think of those things, those dreams that we have had fulfilled and yet have left us disappointed at the end of it all. He does speak, however, of some of the things that people were uh, pursuing um, and and, and achieving, but finding did not satisfy them in this passage. He spoke about some people who were simply looking for, uh, for the provision of life's basic necessities. Look at verse 26. He said, I tell you the truth, you were looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. You had this extraordinary experience of having this this massive meal being provided for you in an extraordinary way. And you want more of that. Wouldn't it be great if you had free lunches? 
and such a, a wonderful provision on a daily basis. And, and, and Jesus said, well, if that's all you were looking for, then you're going up the wrong road and it will not lead you to the destination that you need to reach. You see, there are those people who live in such extreme poverty that they believe a simple meal is all that they need in order to make something of their lives. And yes, there may be truth in that. Uh, We're so used to having easy access to all manner of food uh, in all manner of places. But there are people in the world for whom even today a bowl of rice is all that they will get. And they think, if I can get my bowl of rice, then at least I'll live for one more day. But Jesus is saying something far more than that. He's speaking of a need far greater than even that. Again, there are others who thought that satisfaction was only found through trying to please God. Look at verse 28. They asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? You see, what was in their minds was that they had to justify themselves in God's sight in order to validate themselves as human beings. That if we can, if we can measure up to what God expects of us, then we can, we can feel good about ourselves, that God will accept us and God will bless us. And, and Jesus um, dismisses that. It's not about you trying to be good enough to go, for God in order to validate yourselves, because that's impossible. None of you can measure up to what God expects of you. Still others were looking to the religious system of of their day. Uh, In the case of the crowd in verse 32, it was the way that Jesus referred to Moses. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, that it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For them, Moses was synonymous with the ceremonial ritual that Moses had instituted for Israel back there in the books of Leviticus and of Numbers and of Deuteronomy. And, and, and their mindset was, so long as we observe the ritual, somehow the ritual will meet our needs. But of course, the ritual in Moses' day was never mean, meant to be an end in itself. It was meant to point away from itself. It was meant to symbolically point to God and to the the whole understanding of salvation uh, that comes from God, that the ritual was intended to remind Israel in a very graphic and vivid way uh, that what you need most deeply is a salvation that can only come from heaven, a salvation that only God himself is able to provide. But over the years went by again and again, And it was certainly true in the days when Jesus walked the earth that the Judaism uh, of that time was ritualistic. And and, and it it had allowed the ritual to become an end in itself. They thought that if we go through what is required to us in terms of the ceremonial law, then somehow that will be the means by which we are justified and we are accepted by God. And Jesus is saying, "Don't, don't fool yourself, don't deceive yourself. It is not the ritual that saves you. It's God who saves you. That you should not be looking to these various ceremonial ceremonies that you go through as somehow being the means by which you are redeemed and cleansed. No, you need to be looking to God, the one to whom they point. Because he is the one who, as Jesus says here, has given you the true bread from heaven. A bread that isn't an it, a commodity, but a him who has come in person from heaven to earth for their salvation. See, what Jesus is showing in all these things and others like them is that though people may be conscious of their need, they may so misunderstand the nature of their need that they will then inevitably misunderstand the way in which their deepest needs are going to be met. And the whole purpose of coming to show people that this truth about themselves is that their deepest need is the spiritual need in their heart of hearts, in the depths of their soul. It's the language of the psalmist in Psalm 73, uh, the one who has been tempted to be drawn to the ways of this world where people outwardly seem fulfilled and at peace and satisfied but they've got no interest in God and no time for God. 
And, and the psalmist in, in that psalm goes to, it reaches the point of saying, Lord, whom have I in heaven but you and earth has nothing I desire beside you? My flesh and my heart may fail, but you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The nearness of my God is my good. There was a man who had gone through the struggles that Jesus was identifying here in this chapter. There was a man who had tried the alternatives only to discover the hard way, that they were doomed to fail on every count. But to know God and to be known by God was to have the deepest needs and longings of his soul met in perfection. Second thing that Jesus goes on to speak about here is that he reveals the greatest provision this world has ever received. He himself reveals the greatest provision this world has ever received. You see, as the exchange develops in this uh, discourse between Jesus and the crowds and the way that they respond to them, you can see their curiosity being piqued. Uh, they're, they're, they're eager to, to find out more that lies behind this language that Jesus is using about himself being the bread of heaven. Their curiosity has been aroused and, and uh, deepened as the alternative uh, answers to man's needs have been eliminated. What on earth was Jesus talking about? So as Jesus spoke about the true bread that came down from heaven in verses 32 and 33 and explains what... Um, what the crowds desperately wanted them to, to him to provide for them, um, he, he makes it clear uh, that he himself is the answer to their deepest needs. And at that point, Jesus says in verse 35, I am the bread of heaven. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the second of the I am sayings that are recorded for us in John's gospel. Uh, John uh, has a fascination with um, sevens. So he records seven signs and he records seven I am sayings that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uttered in different circumstances and on different occasions. And, and here um, he is giving yet another clue to his identity. Uh, as Jesus gradually became better known as he went about his earthly ministry, uh, people were curious to, to know who he really was. Up until that point, he'd been known only as the carpenter, carpenter's son from Nazareth. Uh, but through all that he was teaching and all that he was doing, uh, people were coming to realize there's more to this man than meets the eye. Um, and at different points along the way, he, he uttered these, these very uh, thought-provoking statements about himself, loaded statements about himself, because when he used the language of I am, he was quite consciously and deliberately uh, echoing that way in which God had revealed himself to Moses back there in Exodus chapter 3. Remember the burning bush? And the voice speaking to Moses out of the burning bush. And Moses realizes that it is God who's speaking to him. And God is commissioning him to go back to Egypt and to speak to Pharaoh. And to tell Pharaoh that he is to let God's people go. Uh, that they might uh, leave Egypt and be led to the promised land. And, and Moses asks God, well, who's, who shall I say has sent me? Uh, on whose authority am I giving these words to, to, to Pharaoh? And God simply said, tell him, I am has sent you. I am that I am. That sacred name of God by which he was known in a special way to his covenant people Israel. Um, God was saying, go to Pharaoh and simply use my name. Tell him, I am is my authorization the great I am of heaven. And here's Jesus. And he dares to take that name upon his lips, to refer to himself, to say in a way that, that 
uh, that, that unsettled the Jews and troubled the Jews, that this carpenter son from Nazareth was daring to take the name of the Lord God himself upon his lips to identify who he was. He is the one who alone is not only willing, but is actually able to meet the needs of all the people who come to him. It's not a matter of what we have. It's not a matter of what we're able to do or where we happen to come from. It all boils down to who we are in relationship to. And Jesus is simply saying, when you are in relationship to me, when you're in fellowship with me, when you're in in union with me, then all that I am and all that I have becomes yours. It's like that special day when a man and woman are joined together in holy wedlock on their wedding day. The moment that each of those people, bride and groom, says to the other, I do. Will you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? Will you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? The moment that you say, I do, in answer to that question. And the couple is pronounced husband and wife from that point onwards. Then their life is changed forever because they enter a relationship that day which changes their life from that day onwards. It's, it's a, a union in which the, um, all the debts and liabilities of each is transferred to the other. All the strengths and benefits of each is united in that new relationship. And here is Jesus, and he is saying, when you are joined to me, all your debts and liabilities become mine, and all my benefits and uh, enablings become yours. And, and he says, from that point onwards, things can never be the same again because of what we are in fellowship with each other. And he points people to himself, therefore, as God's greatest provision for the world's deepest need. And as he urges uh, the, uh, his listeners to pursue food, to look for food that does not spoil, but rather that endures unto eternal life. He informs them there in verse 27 that the Son of Man will provide it for them. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Indeed, he goes on to make uh, to, to, to take it even further in terms of of that claim in verse 33 uh, he says uh, for uh, for the for the bread of god is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world he is broadening the horizons of his listeners he wasn't coming simply to provide for the needs of ancient israel he was coming to provide for the needs of the world at large and through its ages That's a daring claim to make by any standard. There are not many people in their right mind who would dare to say, I am the answer to the needs of the world. Not just the world at this point in time, but the world throughout its entire history. And yet Jesus backs up his claim and gives warrant to believe that claim by saying, on him, God the Father has placed his seal of of approval. He's got God-given credentials. There are aspects that are attached to the Lord Jesus Christ that set him apart as utterly unique, one of a kind, no one like him before or since, that he uniquely is qualified and capable of being everything that God sends him to be and providing everything that God promises to provide through him. In what sense did God place his seal of approval upon the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that was visible for all to see? Well, just think of it, even from the the moment of his conception. His conception in the womb of the Virgin Mary was announced by angels. 
announced not only to, to Mary, who was to bear this child, but announced to Joseph, the one to whom she was betrothed. And Joseph was told it was not, it was not going to be a child, uh, a conception in which he himself was involved by natural human means. No, this was, this was a child who would be conceived by the Holy Spirit, miraculously, in the womb of this girl from Nazareth. When the child was born, the, child, the, the, the birth was, it was uh, announced by the choirs of angels and heavenly messengers who spoke to the, the shepherds outside Bethlehem and brought them in to see the infant who was lying in the manger. And even when it meant, uh, when, when visitors came from the east, how did they get there? Because, because a star had been placed in the sky for that particular time, with that particular purpose, that's, that foreigners from distant countries would be brought to worship at the feet of the newborn Christ. When he was taken to Jerusalem, the testimony that was borne by Anna and Simeon, the Holy Spirit had made them aware that this child who would be brought to that temple that day was no ordinary child, but one who lay at the very center of God's purpose for the world. And again, as Jesus began his public ministry, he was accredited by the miracles that he performed as being the man from heaven, the words that he spoke which came with the authority of heaven. And ultimately, through the death that he died, that he himself had, had foretold repeatedly throughout his earthly ministry, the Son of Man must be handed over into the hands of wicked men who will uh, torture him and have him put to death, and he will be buried, and he will rise again on the third day. So he was, he was preparing his listeners for what would eventually happen to him, so that it would come, in one sense, as no surprise. The times when the voice of God was heard from heaven at his baptism, the voice of God was heard, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. But of course, it was when he rose from the dead on that third day, triumphant over death and over the grave, that he was vindicated by the Holy Spirit, a vindication that was to, be, was to lead ultimately to him ascending into the glory from which he had first come, where he would be enthroned in glory at the right hand of God's majesty on high. So at every point along the way, Jesus was saying, the seal of God, the seal of his approval was upon him at every turn and at every stage of his earthly existence. And in 2,000 years of church history, that seal has not been weathered and has not been worn out. But Jesus calls then for the simplest response that anyone can ever make. You know, Jesus obviously announces remarkable news and good news in this statement. But the question uh, was, for those who were listening, how do you benefit from what is so tantalizingly offered in this statement? Clearly, it wasn't simply received by osmosis, being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't automatically received by all who were there. Nor was it to be received by uh, performing some arduous challenge that Jesus would issue. Not so. Jesus says, quite simply, whoever comes and whoever believes will receive what he provides. He offers it as a free gift with no strings attached. And that went against everything that had been instilled into the minds of these people in the state that Judaism was in at that time. Because it had become a religion, a religion of merit. If you want something from God by way of grace and mercy, you've got to do something for God in terms of trying to please him or measure up to what he requires. But the beauty of what Jesus is saying is this. The Christian message in its purest form is not a case of you must meet my standards and then receive my reward, but rather trust in me and all that I am and all that I have will be yours and yours forever with nothing held back. It couldn't be more straightforward, nor could it be more extravagant. So why then did the crowd balk at such an open offer and a gracious invitation? 
Well, Jesus senses what was going through their heads in verse 36. But as I told you, he says, you have seen me and still you do not believe. They may have wondered where the small print lay. It all seemed too good to be true. But the answer was that even the simplest things were beyond their reach. It wasn't just a matter of being unable to reach God's standards because their minds were warped, so warped by sin. They could not even take God at his word. They couldn't even accept what God was saying so plainly to them. And that's precisely where we all find ourselves by nature as we stand before God. By nature, we cannot see him. By nature, we cannot trust him. Because sin has turned us in upon ourselves. Sin has made us self-sufficient and self-dependent. And that can only doom us to death and to destruction. And it's only when God does something for us in his grace that we are open, our eyes are open to see him and our heart is opened to trust him. Only then does Jesus go on to show how amazing God's provision really is. He not only provides for our deepest needs, but he actually enables us to respond. Look at verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And again in verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. You see, God looks upon us and he sees our need in its totality. These people are dead in their trespasses and sins. They are incapable of understanding things properly or doing what needs to be done to receive this gift that I'm offering them. You see, God comes to sinners by his spirit so that they in turn can come to his son for their salvation. Which brings us to the last thing. Jesus promises the most contented life a person can ever have. In many ways, it's hard not to be cynical about life lived in this world, because even at its very best, life leaves us wanting. Even in the religious domain, we are so often left disappointed, feeling as though something is missing. But Jesus makes this beautiful promise in, in this verse. He says, Whoever comes to me will never, never be hungry, and he will never be thirsty. It, it's, it's, it's spiritual picture language. But, but the truth that's borne out here is, is that, that even the poorest and most deprived Christians who have the Lord Jesus Christ enjoy the richest and deepest contentment in life. You won't think it's, that surprised me about um, those who, who travel to uh, deprived areas of the world to bring the gospel to people there. And they, they meet Christians in these places and there's extreme poverty and terrible deprivation. And yet these Christians have a peace and a contentment that they've never seen before. A peace and a contentment that's too often missing here in the West amongst Christians. And, and it's simply the fact that there's nothing else for these Christians in these countries to rely upon. So they rest completely in the Lord Jesus Christ and discover him to be their all in all. They, in having him, there's nothing else that they could ever really need. They experience God and they have a foretaste of heaven in a way that's uncluttered by the things that distract us in our part of the world. More than that, he says, whoever comes to me, I'll never drive them away. They'll never be rejected. We live in a world where countless lives are scarred by rejection that comes in different forms and for different reasons. Whether it's a child in the playground who's shunned by the other kids in the playground, they're rejected. And the poor little kid doesn't understand why. Why am I being left out? Why am I not being included? People who are single, not because they want to be single, um, but who have been rejected again and again by those that they've sought to befriend and get close to. So many different circumstances of life 
Issues because of race and because of class, where people don't fit the mold, where aren't accepted uh, into, the, uh, into, the, into the group. And Jesus lovingly and genuinely promises there'll be nobody who's rejected if they come to me. Nobody who'll be turned away. Nobody who, to whom I will say, no, you don't fit. I'm sorry, I haven't got a place for you. Whoever comes to me, I will never ever drive away. And he proved it by the kind of people that he received during his ministry. Even though there were many raised eyebrows as to who Jesus included amongst his 12 disciples, one of whom at least had been a former terrorist. What's he doing having a man like that among his closest followers? The kind of women that he was prepared to receive, women who had come from immoral backgrounds and yet as they put their trust in him, he welcomed them with open arms into his entourage and among his followers. And yet amazingly, if anyone has reason to reject us, it's him. Because not only do we fail to measure up to his standards, but we have blatantly rebelled against him to his face. And yet he says, no, I will not reject you if you come to me. I'll not turn you away. He receives us if we truly believe, with open arms. And he goes on to say, and I will never abandon you to the grave. Not even death itself will separate you from me. The grave will not have the last word over our life, either in this world or the next, because Christ, through his own triumph and resurrection, has secured our future, not just for time, but for all eternity. As we prepare to come around the Lord's table this morning, as we think afresh about what it means to receive him as the bread of life and to feed upon him in our hearts by, by faith with thanksgiving, we have been reminded of all that he is and of all that he has done as the bread of life that was broken for us upon the cross as the one whose blood was spilled for us in order that we might have cleansing and redemption and of the peace of a place in God's family forevermore. Let's pray. Our dear Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you that you are indeed the bread of life. You're the bread of heaven come down to this world to satisfy our deepest longings and to meet our deepest needs. Humbly pray, O Lord, that as we come around your table and as we receive the elements of bread and wine, you would, that you would sanctify them to us for our spiritual nourishment, for our spiritual growth and upbuilding, in order that we might grow in the knowledge of yourself and love for yourself, in order that we might become more like you and more useful in your service. Grant your blessing then, not only upon this your word, but upon this sacrament that you have given us in order that it might be a means of grace to all of us. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen.